remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people would scratch their heads and be like, why isn't Africa being wiped out? Like, why are tens of thousands of people dying in Western Europe with the most sophisticated public health care systems? There is a story that is being told to Europeans, by Europeans, about the necessity of these violent borders. The myth that some countries struggled because they were poor and others didn't because they were wealthy is a complete fiction. I believe the path to building a better future is by asking better questions. I'm Nanjala Nyabola. As a writer and political analyst, I'm always struck by this false binary between communism and capitalism. Have we really exhausted every possible political ideology? I'm Nisreen Malik. As a journalist, I see a pattern of the establishment pushing for a return to an unjust status quo. What does business as usual mean for people who've endured vaccine apartheid? I'm worried about increasingly discriminatory migration and border policies. How many lives might have been saved if countries focused more on global justice than on shutting borders? In crises, existing divides deepen. Gender and race, class and economic inequalities become worse. We are even weaker now. So what can we do about it? Join us as we explore these issues together on Studio B Unscripted. Angela, I have been so excited to have this conversation with you. A lot has happened in the past two years. Um, a lot has change, of change has happened. What really stands out for you that you think really defines or has arrested um, your attention and made you think that this is really what the pandemic has been mm. about? I mean, well, first of all, I'm really excited to be speaking with you as well. I remember the moments when the first doses of vaccine came out, right? And you had all of these people in the United States especially, but across Europe, um, you know, getting vaccinated and then sort of entering very quickly into this imagination of post-pandemic life. Mm -hmm. This is all over, everything's gonna be fine now. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in Nairobi and just looking around and thinking, how, how is this over mm -hmm. when we are, you're not just telling us that we're not gonna get vaccines, but you're telling us we might never get vaccines, right? Because in April of 2020, that was still the conversation that, you know, we'll get to you when we get to you. And that is gonna be the story of this pandemic for me. It's gonna be that inequality, but it's not inevitable, right? Mm. It's a consequence of choice. It's mm. a consequence of refusing to help. I think we underestimate also how much of our experience of the pandemic was refracted through lens that we had no control over, we had not decided. You know, the, the, the way these stories were told to us, the way death tolls were reported, there were stories that could have been said mm. or told very early on that would have made things easier, either in terms of the West response to the pandemic mm -hmm. or the global response to the pandemic in the South. There was a different way to approach this, which is to say, we have made ourselves vulnerable and therefore we are kind of all responsible for what's going on, mm. as opposed to, we shouldn't share our vaccines because we are powerful and others are weak. Yeah. Um, the myth that some countries struggled because they were poor, and others didn't because they were wealthy, is a complete fiction. It's a complete fiction. And I like that you said vulnerability because, well, this is something, again, a lot of Africans, different African countries will have experienced the most recent pandemic before this, which was the HIV AIDS pandemic. Yeah. Completely different. 
at the worst moments in Kenya, we had a prevalence rate of 10%. Mm. So one in every 10 Kenyans was testing HIV AIDS positive. It changed everything. But that also meant that we had to build systems around that. Mm. And there's a resilience that is coming from all of these systems, all of these community health systems that were designed to respond to HIV AIDS. Mm. So we have a lot of community health care workers, right? People will go to even the most remote towns in Kenya. And you'll find there's one person who's been trained in messaging and all of that. And so when I think about vulnerability and I think about the pandemic, there's this narrative that rich countries have about um, how public health should respond. Yeah. People will say things like, we're not gonna give vaccines because the Africans will not know what to do with them. Yeah. And it's like, there is no continent, you know, probably Asia would be comparable where people have more experience getting medicine into people's hands. Mm. So a lot of people in wealthy countries don't have the community health care systems, yeah. don't know what it is to translate the life cycle of a virus into 44 different languages in two weeks. Yeah. And we did that, you know? I remember I was in rural Kenya um, in 2020, very, very small town in Northern Kenya, like a cluster of 20 huts, mm. really. And I went to, to get water and on the door of the kiosk, is a poster, COVID-19 awareness poster mm. in this local language, which probably has like 20,000, 30,000 speakers, mm. right? This is in 2020, like six months into, you know, the worst of the pandemic. Mm. And I just remember looking at that poster and thinking, this doesn't really get captured yeah. in the story of this pandemic. Yeah, It's not attuned to see this thing, this, the way in which people will communities will yeah. rally and respond and so this is tied to the to the issue of Im Im image making and the yeah. obligation of the people who make the images and, yeah. and tie the stories i've gone through this pandemic with this sense that we are losing the fine print of resilience and vulnerability mm. and we're focusing on technical things yeah you know and not the fact that pandemics happen to people yeah. You have to understand how people respond to messaging. Yeah. What are their fears? And I think that for us, um, for a lot of people who are in Africa, in Asia, um, especially because those are two regions that have been deeply affected by, you know, really big diseases. There are things that have changed so much since HIV AIDS that we are so scared of disease at this scale yeah. because we've seen it. Yeah. And we don't argue about masks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like it's been very weird for us to both fly in from the African continent into the UK yeah. and just be like, no one is no wearing, one wearing masks. masks. You know, it's we so don't strange. argue about them because it's yeah. like, it's the least I can do. Yeah. It's the least that I can do because, you know, in Hong Kong, they've survived the They're bird SARS, flu, yeah. SARS, yeah. right? So you tell someone to put a mask over their face, like, yes, absolutely, not just for me, yeah. but for but the for people around else. me. This is where sort of the, the response to the pandemic becomes just not just about people, but about political culture. Yeah. And I think one thing that has been sort of tragically under discussed is how, how, like what you said earlier, like we focus on very technical solutions and technical reasons why the pandemic uh, has ravaged people so much, but there's also sort of subjective conditions. Mm -hmm. There's lifestyle, yeah. there's population distribution, there's people's behavior, there's demographic patterns. So like, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, people would scratch their heads and be like, why isn't Africa being wiped out? Like, why are tens of thousands of people dying in Western Europe with the most sophisticated public health care systems, allegedly, uh, uh, in the West? But, you know, the, the death toll in Africa was, sure, there must have been allow an allowance for underreporting, but still, you know, the allowance could not have covered tens of thousands yeah. of... You would notice. Fatalities. You would notice if, like, tens of thousands <laughs> yeah. of people were dying. And people focused on the technical, yeah. right? Is it is it because, you know, there's, you know, how how is it happening? There's no ventilators, there's no treatment. But no one focused on the sort of 
societal changes the way that there are, for example, no old people's homes. Mm. I'm not saying this is a kind of cultural one-upmanship, but we have to understand that, that diseases, they attack people. people. They don't attack systems. Um, so I think we have actually a couple of questions. Nesrin, I really, really enjoyed your book about the sort of toxic myths and narratives. And my question is this, if these toxic myths are so you know, fun and enticing and validating, especially for those who are benefiting from them, whereas sort of more reasonable human discourse is perhaps less exciting, you know, we've got our sugar of toxic myths, our vegetables of normal human discourse, how do we get people to eat their vegetables? That is such a great That's question. That's a great question. <laughs> so toxic myths are about basically uh, notions and ideas of cultural superiority mm -hmm. that we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel, um, make ourselves feel better than others, simply. Like all countries have these myths yeah. that uh, distinguish them from others. For example, in the UK, it is the myth of uh, a global empire that distinguished the United Kingdom from the rest of the world. Um, in, the, in the US, it's this myth of the American, uh, dream. the American dream, exceptionalism. And so the question is, how do we, you know, these, this, these myths are so compelling, mm. how do we get people to basically eat their greens, eat their porridge mm. and, and tell themselves stories that are more, that are closer to the truth, um, which is that, you know, countries become what they are uh, by happenstance, luck, and sometimes pillaging and robbery. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the, the, the answer is that we just have to um, instill in our public culture and leadership culture the importance of that because it creates social cohesion. It's not just going to be good for a certain group of people. It's going to make society less conflicted. It's going to make it easier to, uh, to create consensus amongst different groups of people. Um, it's going to create an, a, a less divisive political culture. And the example I always like to give is that of Germany mm. after World War II and how much time and money was spent mm. in creating a public, public education and public awareness culture that um, shed light on what happened in the Holocaust. So when I reported in Germany for the book about the resistance to this attitude, it didn't happen easily. There was so much resistance to the kind of modern contemporary German approach to uh, its record in the Holocaust. What people told me constantly was, we sold it to the politicians. We told them your life will be easier. You will get more votes. If you create a culture that is consensual, that is kind, that is accurate, that is about um, get, uh, creating a sense of strength and identity via self-awareness, then you will turn that green into a sweet, right? You will turn it from something you kind of have to do because it's the right thing to do to something that you want to do because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel special. And the Germans are so proud. They are so proud of their post-Holocaust culture mm -hmm. because they're like, we constantly talk about it. We constantly not, we, we don't deny it. It has become a point of pride for them. Mm -hmm. And so when I see cultures really driven apart, rent asunder by these arguments about slavery, imperialism, colonialism, I'm like, there is an easier way. Mm -hmm. You can actually make yourself good, feel good mm -hmm. by really owning, apologizing, repairing for, and, 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 um, uh, giving yourself some status that you've done a good thing mm. and that will be a positive status. It'll be a positive exceptionalism mm. as opposed to a negative one. We're beginning to see that in the UK. We're actually beginning to see it. We're beginning to see people begin to associate a new attitude towards imperialism and colonialism. But, um, I don't mean to be a skeptic about this, but do you think that... Um, because there's obviously backlash, right? Yes. And like what we're experiencing right now is the people who don't want to let go yes. of that old narrative and want this return to this m mythical, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire exactly. and, and want to restore that myth. And so I guess the, the, the next stage is how do you then, because that process of turning the green into a sweet is someone is going to have to lose, right? Yeah. If you are... If you are accustomed to privilege, equality feels like loss. Yeah. You know, do you think that there is enough, I mean, knowledge there or 
even willingness there to sit with that discomfort? Or are we, I mean, going to continue to endure this period of backlash, right? Oh yeah, oh no, we will. Yeah. It's gonna take a while. I think, I mean, one of the things that we have to be, um, we have to make our peace with, mm. and I think sometimes we can we can get impatient. Mm. It's not about them being comfortable with change, it's about us being comfortable with their resistance, because yeah. it will take time. Yeah. Next question. My question is for Nangela. Um, your book, Traveling with Wild Black, was very meaningful to me, and my question for you is, what was the most surprising thing that you learned while researching and writing this book? Um, I write in the book about my experience in Palermo, in Sicily. And so I actually went there because, uh, in, just after the worst of the Mediterranean crisis from 2017. And I went there with an anxiety of being a black woman writing a story about black migration mm. at a time when so much violence had become normalized. Mm. And what was I gonna find? How was I going to be received? I was there by myself. And what I found in Italy was, uh, in Palermo especially, was Europe divided unto itself. Mm. That there was a sense in this small town that what was happening was deeply unjust, but they didn't know what to do about it. Mm. So because they're on the front line, when bodies wash up, they wash up on their beaches. When people, when boats capsize, when the ships, you know, rescue people, they end up in their ports. They're not sitting in Milan and in Rome and in Brussels dealing with abstractions. They're mm. dealing with real people. Mm. And you see the same thing in Hungary, you know, with the Hungary uh, refugee crisis. It's the people who actually have to go and fish those bodies out of the barbed wire. They have a completely different moral structure from the people who are sitting in the capital passing all of these really, really cruel uh, refugee laws. And so I remember going up to the mayor and asking him, what do you think about what's happening? And um, he said to me, you, I, I believe that in 50 years, Europe will be facing charges of crimes against humanity for what they're doing in the Mediterranean Sea. Wow. And I was completely stunned because I didn't expect to hear that from a person who had power mm. at a time when the line was, this is an acceptable cost to defending European borders. And I just have always found borders to be completely um, violent things. Nobody leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. People mm. don't just flee unless there's something really difficult. So for me, the experience of witnessing came with this realization. Again, we talked about stories and narrative. There is a story that is being told to Europeans by Europeans about the necessity of these violent borders um, that the people who are on the front line, the people who are having to dredge the bodies out of the water are experiencing something completely different. Mm. And that story doesn't necessarily get captured in either, in either direction. So that was a really big surprise for me. And it's something that I'm still you know, working with. Yeah, it, 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 I feel like all the questions come back to how do we get people motivated to tell a different, yeah. a different story. I think we have another question. Hi, my name is Shruti, I'm from Nairobi. My question is for Nanjala. So um, my experience in 2020 was that all of our judgments and all of our actions to do with COVID were all kind of guided by Western voices in Kenya. So that could be the embassies or either or other UN bodies. Did you find that the Western voice um, was given more importance in Kenya? And if yes, why do you think that is? I spent a lot of time in that first year of the pandemic outside the capital, sort of speaking to people in um, small informal settlements, rural areas and things like that. I remember mobilizing to buy these um, jerry cans, 20 liter jerry cans to put in every single uh, home so that because these people don't have running water to put in every single home so that people would have a source of water for washing their hands. Right. And that story didn't get reported anywhere, not even in Kenyan media, didn't get reported anywhere. 
Um, when the WHO released the official guidelines um, of how to combat, you know, the three points, wash your hands, da da da, -da mask, um, there was a mobilization to have that material translated into every single local language in Kenya. Within days, mm. people volunteered, offered the translations, didn't get reported yeah. anywhere. And so it's not always a case of that the foreign governments dominated the action or the reaction. It's more of a case that we are attuned to listen to the stories of power, that our systems are attuned to picking up those voices and amplifying them so that when a certain embassy donates $10,000 to buy masks or whatever, you know, there's gonna be a launch Mm -hmm. There's going to be a photograph, there's going to be handshaking, probably be a couple of flags in the background, yeah. right? But when communities come together and provide for each other, it doesn't get the same amplification. Yeah. For me, it really comes down to people did so much yeah. that didn't get captured yeah. and didn't get told. And it's not going in the archives. It's the archives will just record it as the Kenyan government received 10,000 masks from, you know, this yeah. other government. Well, it's going in the archives for this conversation. I hope so. so. <laughs> That's a start. Uh, next question, please. Hi. You both spoke about how pandemics happen to people and we have seen how this pandemic has totally obliterated the education system. How do we then, as, as citizens, help to ensure that we do not end up with a lost generation of learners? Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is, actually, this is actually a global issue. So there are people who lived in countries where some children, despite school shutting down, had access to online education and some children didn't have access to online education. So what will likely happen is that we will have sort of a generation lost along the lines of their access to the tools and the privileges, basically, of education. What needs to happen, basically, after this pandemic or during these stages of the pandemic is a sort of Marshall Plan, yeah. right? There needs to be a sort of global pot in which people bung a bunch of money and they allocate it to certain sort of infrastructure rehabil rehabilitation projects. And one of those should be education. And what I fear is that we will focus on the kind of he the top line issues, you know, things like uh, re restoring the economy, getting our GDP back strong, you know, uh, stimulating consumer habits, like all this stuff, all the technical stuff yeah. that give us a sense that, that our society and our economy is healthy is going to take precedence. I mean, I feel like that's a really powerful observation and embedded in that is this separation that's happened between the economy, whatever that weird animal yes. energy is, yeah. and life, right? Yeah. And real life. We've allowed this weird mythical energy to separate itself from the reality of our lives. And it is dominant over everything. Yeah. All hail the economy. That is all, you know, everything must be done in service of the economy, whatever that means. Um, and I guess it just kind of goes back to the thing that we were talking about, which yeah. is the pandemic didn't create all of these problems so much as it showed us our true colors. Yeah, and, and it showed us actually uh, what we invest in as real and what we invest in as kind of not real or irrelevant. And it's become clear that we think the economy is real, but that the people who make up the economy that we need to create this economy are not real somehow. So great questions. Thank you so much, everyone. I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, and thank you, Manjana. Thank you. <laughs>
we're talking about the conflict in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. the conflict um, in Somalia. What do you think it tells us about where the world is right now? Well, what's really interesting is our generation from North Africa and the Middle East that grew up, um, experienced the Arab, Spring, the Arab Spring and then the aftermath of the Arab Spring, one thing that it taught us, and that I think is a really salutary tale, is the false promise of technology. Mm. There is this image I will never forget um, from the protests in Egypt. It was such an exciting time mm. where somebody had graffitied on four sort of shop front doors, had graffitied the logos of Twitter, Facebook, um, I think Google, and that was a time when the promise of digital platforms, the promise of social media, was that it had single-handedly overthrown the most entrenched authoritarian yeah. regimes across the Middle East and North Africa. I still can't believe it happened mm -hmm. for the five minutes that it did. Um, but what then happened after the Arab Spring was a sort of retrenchment, a return to the status quo that became even more um, violent and even more authoritarian. We're kind of living with Arab dictatorship 2.0. But in that lesson, what these new leaders learned, sort of the CCs and the, uh, and the Bashar al-Assads, that, that the social media space is the, as dangerous as the street, if not more dangerous. So it came to be policed as much as the street was policed. And that lesson, that understanding was catastrophic. Because what happens now is that you won't, you can't protest in the street, but if you post anything on social media, uh, in many countries across the Arab world and North Africa, the government has such a sophisticated understanding and such a sophisticated surveillance mechanism that you can be imprisoned for a TikTok video, which happened in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, you can be sent down for, for Facebook statuses, mm -hmm. complaining about like dirty streets. And so the, the, the tech space, the digital media space, over the past two years, because we've all been in our homes, has, has gained so much more significance, but is still a place where the power jostles with the people. Yeah. When the Sudanese revolution happened, social media ha again had that promise, right? It again had that capacity to bring people together and to overthrow this dictator, Amr al-Bashir, who was there for 30 years. And then the lesson was learned very quickly. And when a counter coup happened and the second revolution took place and is taking place at the moment with lots of people out on the streets protesting the new military junta in Sudan, their internet access is being shut down. So I think Sudan was off the grid um, for internet access for a good two, three weeks mm. after the latest uh, coup. And so the tech space now is a sort of it's like a tap. Sometimes it opens and it flows and you get this amazing momentum, particularly as I've seen in my home country of Sudan, to get people out on the streets, to get them to fight valiantly against, you know, another military dictatorship. But at the same time, I am seeing accounts of vigilante paramilitary forces on Instagram who are from, from the Sudanese uh, military government. And so... I'm like, how is, this, how is this space something that we can take advantage of when all the, all the powerful uh, people are squatting there with their completely unfiltered propaganda? Everything is up for grabs. There's lots of good that can be done with it, but lots of very powerful forces and very weak regulation that mean that, that its promise is very fragile. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think that the companies get that? You know, I, I really don't, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, and this East Africa, I think, is kind of like a crucible right. for a lot of these challenges. And one of the things that stands out for me with Ethiopia is a lot of the platforms didn't, quote unquote, speak Ethiopian languages, no yeah. content moderation or whatever, until 2019. Wow. It was fairly late in the game. And by this point, this culture of, um, you know, disseminating hate speech, 
people squatting on, you know, powerful people passing on, saying two things, you know, saying one thing in the English version of yeah. the post and something completely different in the non-English version of the post, it's already become normalized, right? Yeah. And I just sometimes feel like they don't understand a, the size and the scope of what they've taken on. Because Sudanese people are fighting for their freedom. They're yeah. fighting for their lives, right? And so for you, for you, you being the tech company, giving this blue tick is, you know, playing nice with power. Yeah. For them, it's endorsing, normalizing, you know, giving, giving power to someone who is destroying them yeah and sometimes I feel like that gap in understanding yeah um is is more harmful mm. than they're willing to internalize mm. mostly because when you break it down if they were to to pay attention to that gap carefully it would cost them a lot of money exactly <laughs> yeah. right it would cost them a lot of money to to speak you know speak quote unquote all of Ethiopia's language is 110 million people. But how much do you think that there is an incentive not to understand, right? I think that I think that that's changing. I think right. for a long time there was an incentive because the idea was, who do we assume the tech user is? Yeah. There is an English speaking, upper middle class white man who has an ability to interface with power. Right. Right, when someone, uh, when a, a, a pipe bursts down his street, he can email his council and the council will right. do something about it. So I don't have to, yeah. as you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, I don't have to do anything for this guy because someone else will. Yeah. Whereas for the average African, Asian, Latin American internet user doesn't have that experience with power. Mm. You know, when this pipe bursts on the street, it stays yeah. burst until someone decides to fix it. And so I feel like it's changing now. The calculus is changing. Is it too late? Yeah. Are we trying to, you know, shut the stable doors after the horse has bolted? Because the kind of violence that we've seen that can be connected directly to the lack of investment yeah. in understanding these markets, it's just tremendous. You know, Myanmar, yeah. Ethiopia. You know, right now in the Central African Republic, and this is one country that always stays with me because it's a country that no one really pays attention to. Yeah. And they've been at war for the better part of the last 15 years. And their misinformation campaigns being driven by Western, Eastern governments. And it doesn't crack, you know, the surface of the news cycle. Mm. Um, it doesn't become a thing that is a red flag that we should be paying attention to. Mm. And I look at that and I think, have the lessons been learned? Yeah. I don't know. Because I think sometimes we tend to talk about social media as this separate plane that has its own rules and has its own referees. But I think it's, it also interplays quite in a quite complex way with actual media and tries to get actual media to pick it up and 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 become yeah. viral yeah um there's like lots of virality chasing going on so how much do you think the kind of storytelling aspect also plays into the ways in which tech platforms um have become motivated yeah. in 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 different ways when traditional media retreats lack of funding, lack of finances, advertising yeah. crisis, whatever, social media starts to take up a little bit of that space. Mm. And so there is a reinforcing cycle. There is the things that do rise to the top, the things that are the most viral, the things yep. that are most being discussed. Someone's gonna pick it up yep. and is gonna put it on the 10 o'clock news. It's gonna put it on the seven o'clock news. It's gonna put it on the radio. And so even people who are not on social media will find themselves discussing that story. Exactly. There is also though that the rules are slightly different in who gets to decide what's the thing that rises to the top? Right. And this is one of the things that a lot of companies, a lot of governments, they've started to figure out. They can yeah. game the system. I can buy the hashtag. Yeah. I can buy, you know, and put a couple of bots. It's sent, again, I go back to the Central African Republic. Even Facebook itself conceded that they had found networks of what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior by foreign governments to influence what goes viral. And so there is this thing where the 
there is an increasing awareness, I think, with the social media companies that they're kind of playing in the media space. But I feel like there's still this lack of accountability, I guess. Yeah, it, 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 feels, it feels very Wild West at the moment. Yeah. What I think is most worrying, um, particularly in the context of the pandemic, is how we consume our media or how we interact with each other has become about little sachets, little parcels mm. of information, little things that you can pop. You know what I mean? Like yeah. this, like a like a pill or a sweet or a snack. And this is not some moral panic about how we've lost our attention span, <laughs> which we have done. Uh, For sure. That. But I think the way that things are parceled now means that we we experience the world or we consume the world in bite-sized chunks. No pun intended. So like we always stay in gear one, which means in the context of, in the context of the pandemic that it was impossible to get people to pay attention to anything apart from the most basic facts yep. about why things were going wrong. Uh, if you want to talk about um, uh, COVID-19 vaccines to the South, all you need is one viral story about 10,000 vaccines destroyed because they had expired because there was no storage facility in some part of Africa. And that will be the story and it will be clipped and it will become viral. And then there is no way to get beyond that, mm. that story. And so I think that the, the, the danger, apart from the misinformation aspect of it, I think I'm actually, I think I'm less bothered about the misinformation aspect of it than I am about the, the sort of- The short attention. The short, the, the short story, the short headline aspect of it. Um, because it then designs our brains or prepares us to think about the world in ways that are incredibly simplistic, stereotypical, cliche, not complex. And so this is what I'm struggling with now, is like, how do you get people to pay attention for a second longer, for a couple of seconds longer? Like, I've probably already lost half the viewers already. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like, this is, this is what I'm preoccupied with but at the moment. Is that a social media problem? Is that a media problem? Yeah. Because I feel like the memification of the news, in some ways, it's like a mutually reinforcing thing that's happened between social media and traditional media because a lot of the headlines are gamed yeah. to play into that cycle, and yeah. to play into that sh short attention span. I mean, the the, the whole um, you know sensationalist spin with the commercialization, especially in the United States, you know, yeah. the commercialization of the news. Um, you know, when you yeah, see, it's like it's like it's like tuning into a movie. I literally, I will say this to anybody: make news boring again. Yeah, make it boring again, so that we can, you know, it's something that we have to sit through because mm. it's good for us. But but it's something that we process. There's something that's happened to the stories that we have telling ourselves and to the way in which stories are presented. I think is making it difficult for people to hold complexity. Yeah, I just want to interrogate. <laughs> you know, my, the limits of my engagement with the world as reflections of the limits of how information is presented to me. Um, and I think that we, we are in a place where we, the onus is on us actually just to work a little bit harder, not, not in a way that's sort of preachy or worthy or going off the grid or whatever, but it's just to kind of have your skepticism filter on all the time. You're yeah. like, mm, this, this seems a bit too, 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 too nippy, easy. too neat, too viral for it yeah. to, cap to capture all that it, there is about the story. Yeah. Um, we are going to go into questions now. Great. Hi, my name is Nish Chana. So fake news and misinformation have become a weapon for many of those who want to peddle toxic myths and divisive narratives. But what can be the weapon for those who want to counter, challenge these uh, divisive narratives? Mm. So, so this, is, this is a question that I get asked a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. The answer is very simple. It is that we can just refuse to treat these stories or these accounts as fact. Mm -hmm. And I think like the thing I just plead with people to do all the time is to step back and question sources that you have no reason to question because they are like respectable newspapers, they're on the newsstand. You just assume that they know what they're doing. That is not a safe assumption. When you are asked to comment, when you are asked to consume, when you're asked to engage with these stories, do not say this is fake news. Just be like, I haven't seen the story anywhere else. 
So can we just, can, can, I'll need to go and look at my, yeah. my, my sources for that. Yeah. That is a very small thing that we can all do. And together, when you put it all together, when people do this and you multiply it, it's actually incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. And we have another question. Hi, everybody. What I really want to ask is, are these digital platforms kind of inherently divisive? Or is there a way that we can use uh, these platforms to fight xenophobia and fight Afrophobia and possibly uh, work towards a new kind of uh, pan-Africanism using these uh, digital tools? This is all you. You know, this is a really interesting question. I think, like you said at the top when you're talking about the Arab yeah. Spring, there was a moment especially when nobody was paying attention to how Africans were using social media, there was a moment that they had tremendous power because they were intensifying this momentum that was present. Within, it's a generational shift. There are young people who want there to be this new Pan-Africanism and want there to be this new conversation about what it means to belong yeah. and to be part of this greater community. Yeah. But I want people to be cautious. Yeah. I want people to be attentive to the commercial interests that shape these platforms. They are not built to advance African democracy. Yeah. They're not built to advance Pan-Africanism. They're not built to advance um, you know, political freedom. They're built to make money. And where there is a clash between financial interests and the political interests, what we've seen has been that the financial interest sort of runs away before the political interest has a chance to put on its shoes. Mm. And so I do believe that there is some potential for tech because again, this other thing that people need to remember is that social media is not the internet. Yeah, you know, the it's not tech. The internet is also, you know, community forums. The yeah. internet is also listservs. The internet is also, you know, people organizing on, um, you know, a telegram and signal to have, you know, community defense and so, Use it with caution. Yeah. Tap into the potential. Be careful about being overly reliant on the potential. That's where I would land on that. Um, we have a next question. Hello, Nanjala. Hello, Nisreen. My question is that, uh, as a personal experience, it is often hard to get a visa to access to many countries. As we are people of color with what we call weak passports, how should we deal with acts of discrimination, humiliation, be it at airports or as a tourist or students in another country? Thank you so much. You know what? I, it's something that just brings up, I guess have like this visceral reaction. Yeah, no, when you too. think about all of the humiliations that you've navigated and that you've witnessed people navigate, um, just a very quick anecdote. I was recently at the airport in Nairobi, actually, and this uh, Somali family was going through immigrant was going through one of these things that's happened is that European governments have kind of outsourced the immigration function yeah. to airport officials in global south countries. so your your first round of immigration questions is the you know airline ticketing yeah. agent. It's the person who checks you again before you board the plane. And this poor man had, he had six kids, he had a hearing aid in, he had, and his wife was in a wheelchair. And he was trying to get in front of the line. And the way in which the European passengers yelled at him wow. <laughs> for quote unquote, cutting the line. And then the reaction of the gate staff to side with the European passengers mm. and I find myself in a position being a person who doesn't like to speak when she's at the airport who doesn't I just kind of want to put on my headphones get on the plane and sleep it off to be in a position where you have to intervene mm. this is a decision that a lot of us have to make a lot of the times when we're at the airport when we're at the border mm. when we're at the embassy um, it might be you mm. you might be the person who's being humiliated mm. and I think Especially when you speak to, northern, to people from the global north, 
they think that it's just paperwork. They think that the problem, the thing we're complaining about yeah. is that we have to fill in forms. And they think it's a privileged problem. It's a privileged problem, yeah. right? And it's not the paperwork. It's the fact that the paperwork is designed to humiliate. Yeah. It's the fact that the paperwork is asking you questions that you would never have to answer if you had a different, you know, passport, if you had, if you were a different race, right? Mm. So it's, what is your grandfather's surname? Yeah. It is, how much money have you had in the bank for the last two years? It is, you know, um, where have you lived in the last 10 years? Where have you been? Because you couldn't have possibly been to more than two countries. And it's that humiliation that is so difficult to narrate that is so difficult to fight back against because a lot of us are scared to mm. be in that moment because what if I speak up and they don't let me in? What if I say something because my government's not gonna help me? No. The real reality of the world we live in right now is that the border yeah. is the site of some of the most casual and bureaucratized violence that is being seen anywhere in the world anywhere in the world right now, the things that people endure when they're crossing international frontiers is we've normalized death, mm. we've normalized humiliation, we've normalized, you know, I mean, the, the, some of the interrogations that I've endured just for showing up black, I couldn't, it just, you get to get a visceral reaction to it. Yeah. It's like, it, it takes you back to a very dark place. But I do think, I think that on a broader scale, we have to start speaking back. Yeah. You know, there's an injustice here that we need to, to address. Why does an embassy official feel empowered to shout? I completely agree. We need to think more about talking about borders, not as sort of inevitabilities that we need to get better at bureaucratizing. Um, we need to talk about borders as manifestations of violent and, apartheid, yeah, basically. Yeah. And what naturally comes from that is when you realize that you have won the lottery, basically, then you are more inclined to share because you realize that it's not your doing, that it's luck and happenstance. And that means it is your duty to help others who just fell on the wrong side of that, of that. Of that divide. It was a wonderful conversation. Oh my between. goodness, just <laughs> wonderful. I'm so happy I'm to have had this happy. opportunity. I hope the viewers enjoyed it. I'm really grateful to the to the questioners. Yes. Um, and hopefully in another two years, uh, some of these things would have taken. And somehow. something will have changed. <laughs> Social distance fist bump. Social distance fist bump. <laughs>you come into my house steal my objects and then you know a few years later tell me i can't give this back to you because you might not be able to look after it it's outrageous he said uh my name is so and so from the swedish academy and i said what's this some kind of prank <laughs> and then he said you have won the nobel prize in literature what about the communities from which these objects were taken from you know do we have is there anything in the media about these people what we know is how Western Museum directors.